Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got two minutes extra, I think. I see. Oh, sorry, five. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're very generous. Ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to be with you here because also not only uh, to see such wonderful, young, bright, enthusi enthusiastic minds, but also to feel your thrill because I'm myself a former debater and I do feel your pain. I do feel your, your, um, your frustration, your, your, your fear, your panic. Uh, you know, when, 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 the, when the throat starts, uh, uh, you know, saying things which, which, which are, you are not intending to, to, to say, but also the thrill and the enthusiasm after you have stepped down from the debating stage and rejoined your friends. So really, good job to all of you. We, ha we were watching a wonderful final debate. Congrats to you. <laughs> Talking about our uh, first public debate uh, topic uh, on democracy, state of democracy in Europe, and the role of youth in democratic processes, I would like to first step a bit uh, aside and uh, give a bit of a broader perspective on where Europe is today. Uh, and think for a moment, where do we find ourselves today on the 1st of December? It's not only a very important occasion, Yvonne's birthday, <laughs> by the way, <laughs> but also uh, the moment when the European Union perhaps finds itself in the most, uh, in the worst really, and the most uh, dramatic crisis in its history. Indeed, an existential crisis between either further integration or further disintegration, fragmentation, and even collapse. It is, I would say, not only a crisis of economic uh, uh, magnitude. It's not only a sovereign debt crisis, growth crisis, or banking crisis. It is definitely a much more profound crisis of leadership, of vision, of direction, and indeed uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, European future. And besides all that, European Union is still facing uh, still unresolved issues. First of all, of course, the demographic issues. We've, we have discussed that today in, in the, in, in, and yesterday in, in your debates about the falling birth rate, uh, aging, uh, aging population, and indeed shrinking Europe. Europe is still facing the integration challenges with uh, uncontrolled migration, failures of integration, rising xenophobia, r uh, racism, anti-Semitism, and nationalism across Europe, east or west, south or north. No country is immune from that. We have to admit it's a pan-European problem today. And thirdly, of course, Europe is facing a democratic challenge, the topic of this debate. Democratic challenge which is not only uh, viewed in the way European Parliament, every single election drops in the voter turnout. Not only viewed in the um, way European citizens are losing trust in political process, in political system, in political parties, but is also viewed in the way that mainstream politicians and mainstream political actors and leaders are losing monopoly or even losing control over the political debate and in many ways it's their own fault. This political monopoly is being taken away by the unaccountable, unrepresentable, and indeed uh, uh, very often uh, uh, anonymous actors, such as the markets, the rating agencies, different uh, groups, radical, populist, xenophobic groups around Europe. Indeed, it is a major democratic challenge for our union today. And moreover, in all that perspective, European Union also is becoming more and more strategically irrelevant in the world affairs, being eclipsed by the rising powers in Asia, China, India, but also other countries like Brazil and South Africa and, and Indonesia. In many ways, if you look at Europe today, European Union altogether, 27 countries, 500 million people, uh, account for about 8% of global population and about 25% of global economy. So we're still very strong, one fourth of global economy, this, the largest single market in the world. However, if the demographic uh, uh, tendencies continue, if we are shrinking even further, if we are not being able to control migration and integration, in many ways, in 2040, the statistics show that European Union will account only for 4% of global population and only 10% of global economy, which means that 96% of global population will live outside of European Union, and 90% of entire global economy will be created elsewhere, not here. And we have to be mindful of that today as we speak about European future. And yet, despite of us being fragile, 
uh, in many ways very uh, weak and, and confused. The demand for European strength, for European unity, and for European action has never been greater, at least in three areas. First of all, from our own citizens. You know, the expectations for, from them are enormous. Firstly, tackling, of course, economic crisis. Secondly, uh, boosting jobs, boosting growth, boosting innovation on European scale. And third, of course, tackling the challenges which can only be tackled by us together, like environment, energy security, climate change, etc. Secondly, I would say we see a huge demand for Europe in its immediate neighborhood, whether in the south, trying to help build up democratic structures in Egypt, Libya, uh, Tunisia, or indeed in Syria tomorrow, or indeed in the east, trying to help uh, the um, fragile democracies in Ukraine or Georgia, or indeed promoting reforms in Moldova, trying to help Armenia and Azerbaijan to resolve the long-lasting Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, or indeed promoting democracy and civil society in Belarus. Or, even more uh, profoundly, in Western Balkans, where the countries are still lining up to join the European Union. While we have lost the confidence in ourselves, these countries still believe in the European Union and see it as their ultimate destiny whether that would be the Bosnia-Herzegovina or indeed Albania, uh, Croatia, which will join next year in July, or Kosovo and Serbia. In many ways, in some of those countries, like in Kosovo and Serbia, European Union is the only possible solution to reconcile those countries in the regional uh, uh, context. And finally, the European action is needed more than ever globally, whether in Middle East or in, in, in uh, Afghanistan, or indeed in tackling such regimes as North Korea, uh, or helping the reform process in Burma and elsewhere. So, we, we, we are needed badly, we are in a really bad situation, and we cannot afford to fail. What should we do? First of all, uh, complete the integration. Next to the monetary union, you've heard about the banking union, we are working towards fin uh, fiscal union, which will, in the end, be also accompanied by the political union. Secondly, in order to legitimize our integration and our further uh, consolidation, we need democratic legitimacy. Uh, one goes, doesn't go without the other. And there, the European Parliament, which I represent, is both a, a source of the problem, but also a source of the solution. In many ways, um, 2014 European elections will be a key battleground for European debate. Either we lose Europe or we win it back. How to do that? In many ways, there are many different solutions. One could be direct uh, uh, election, of course, by European Parliament of European Commission President, and each European political party in the next elections proposing their own candidates in, 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 in the European elections, so that the people who vote the European Parliament vote at the same time for the executive, not only for the legislature. Secondly, we need badly to reform the political parties and make them pan-European with much stronger pan-European ideas. And third, I'd say the cooperation of our parliament with national parliaments and with civil society is key. In all of that, role of youth is critical. Why? I would say at least for three reasons. First, you are, the young generation is the first cross-border generation. I know I have to wrap up, but this is you know, the key uh, part of my speech, so I'm very sorry. Um, cross-border genera generation, which, which is the first one in history of Europe which thinks globally, which acts in European way, and which can bring together uh, different ethnicities and cultures uh, through the Erasmus spirit. Secondly, the young generation is the example of openness, of creativity and innovation, and we need European ideas, and the ideas is what we lack, and the youth can bring them on the table. And third, communication. This generation more than anybody else knows how to communicate effectively, not only through uh, conventional means, but mostly from the social media. We've seen the young generation making revolution in uh, North, Northern Africa, in Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria. We can use social media to make our own politicians accountable and to make sure that the young gener generation, not even without being elected to the positions, affect the political decisions uh, in Europe. So in many ways, dear future prime ministers, dear future presidents, dear future CEOs and community leaders, uh, the initiative and the future is in your hands. And if you fail that, then we all go down with you. But I have high hopes with you. Good luck. And youth should be involved much harder in the democratic decision making. Thank you. Woo!